on the campus of UCLA and one of the featured guests this year and in many of the years in the past is Claire Vidal. Hello, Mr. Vidal. Happy to be here again. It has been this year, I think, 60 years since the publication of your first book. What does that feel like? <laughs> Feels old. It's everything they say about age is true. <clears throat> I turned 80, and I thought I could just, you know, kind of, kind of drift through it, you know, pretend it wasn't there. You spend a lot of time talking to doctors. Why, I don't know. They're not terribly interesting except uh, on what they think is wrong. And you, then you come back a year or two later if you're still here. They said, you know, our treatment for um, diabetes and it was such a mistake. You know, we didn't realize that. And I said, well, that's the medicine you gave me for 20 years. Oh, yes, yes, yes. No, I didn't mean that. What I meant was, you know, just I try to remember everything they tell me to take and perhaps not take them. Do you find that whole process frustrating? Yeah, but I think age is meant to be. So It certainly is not a tranquil time. So busy. Well, for you, it's busy. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I think it's busy for most people. I mean, you have to make a will. <laughs> you have to talk to an accountant. You have to pay your taxes. They, they keep you busy. Your biographers say that you, you were not, you came from fairly humble beginnings. You, you were not, you were a man who made his living by his writing. Is that correct? Yes, I did. And um, it is rare. A lot of people sort of do it, but they teach. And I just said, no, I said, the academy has wrecked more writers than poverty because they become bureaucrats and they end up teaching subjects eventually they don't like. They don't get their writing done. I see it's a natural home for poets because poets simply do not draw very often a large audience. So it's a, for a prose writer. We have to be out there in the bustle of the world, you know, to understand, to begin to understand anything. When in these past three, four years did you make that dis the decision to spend a lot of the this next several books on the whole issue of this administration and our foreign affairs? <laughs> this administration decided me that I had no choice but to go into the terrible things that is done to us. I mean specifically us as a polity to the republic. You know, it's going to take two, three generations to get the Constitution back, get money power back to Congress, declarations of war back to the House of Representatives. Everything has just been skewed. And the media is so poisonous, and they are almost spokespersons for this administration. Every time that I'm a wartime president, I'm a wartime president. Well, why doesn't somebody say you're not one? There is no war. Yes, you get us into military messes, which you don't know how to handle. But uh, you need a, for a war, you need another country. You need a declaration by the Congress. And you need, uh, well, a palpable enemy. War on terror, that's a bit like war on dandruff. It's, too, it's an abstract noun. It's, it's far too abstract. Well, instead of stopping him in his tracks, anything the administration says, and this is what is so startling, having lived in and around politics for 70 years now. And run for Congress yourself. Yes. I've never seen such an unquestioning media. Whatever the president says, they repeat it because you see he's the president. Well, suppose it's a lie, and you know it's a lie. These journalists are not dumb, and uh, their editors I'm not dumb either, but their editors may be following a different uh, drum beat. And you see that as different than 20, 30, 40 years ago, different administrations? Oh, yes. You know, Franklin Roosevelt, and I was brought up as a kid when he was president, he knew exactly what he was doing. The journalists liked him. The publishers hated him. So every publisher was against him, and every journalist was undoing his publisher with these stories. And that's how he got a balance out of it. We have no balance now. I don't know a single journalist who takes seriously, except some those weirdos on Fox News. But except for them, I don't know anybody who really likes what Bush is doing with Iraq and 
Katrina or not doing. So they complain, but then you look at the newspapers. Well, where's the story? Congressman Conyers went up to Ohio. He's ranking Democrat in the Judiciary Committee. He did a report on how the election was stolen in 2004 and that the real winner was not Bush. He wrote a report on it, very good one. To be helpful, I wrote a preface for him. And since I'm in and out of the internet nowadays, I thought, well, something was going to happen. This is devastating. Second election stolen in a row, presidential. And no mention in the New York Times of his book. No mention in the Washington Post, which is now a court circular for the, for the emperor at home. And suddenly there were no reviews anywhere. And I thought, the country's gone. People don't care about the republic. There's nothing left to care about because there is no country. That's all we have. And to watch it being messed up, I've been thinking lately, I'm getting terribly radical in these matters, that about an amendment of the Constitution. To do what? Recall a president who's incompetent. Why the founders didn't think of it, I don't know. But they thought, well, every two years, we elect a new House of Representatives. They didn't realize between gerrymandering and spending billions and billions of dollars uh, to reelect the same people over and over and over again that there was no chance of the people's voice being heard. They could just keep tight control over them. So we need a recall of some kind. And even at times, you know, I wonder a bit about the sanity of some of these people. Take on Iran now. Just when we're sinking in Iraq, it's going to be it's worse than Iraq. I mean, uh, Indochina, no. And where are the voices against it? Every now and then there's a little demonstration. I spoke out here on the famous February before the 9/11, before the uh, Iraq invasion. Mm -hmm. We had about 100,000 people somewhere between La Brea and. Uh, the very end of that section of uh, Hollywood Boulevard. And I was on a platform. I could see all these people up there. The LA Times, which is generally a pretty good paper about reporting these things, nobody there. Somebody cheated them at the, uh, at the paper and ran a picture of us all. So you saw a picture of 100,000 people snaking all the way up from La Brea. And uh, then the story, which completely contradicted what we saw. But you can't always count on you know, a makeup man. <laughs> you uh, briefly mentioned uh, those years you were growing up. I want to take you back <coughs> there because I want you to tell the story about reading to your grandfather. Well, he was blind at the age of 10 due to two separate accidents, a small town in Mississippi. And uh, he insisted not on going home for the blind. He went to law school with a cousin who read to him. And this was in what period of time? This would be 18, 1880s. Mm -hmm. Then he went west. And we had lived in that part of northern Mississippi where the Chickasaw tribe had been. And the Chickasaw tribe had moved into the Indian Territory to the west in what is now Oklahoma. So he went out there and became their first senator and brought the state into the Union in 1907 and served until 1937. So he had a house in Rock Creek Park. And I spent most of my time until I was 17 and went in the Army. Uh, I read to him. That was the rent I paid. And of course, he was giving me a great education. I not only did the congressional record, but I was the only 10-year-old who understood bimetallism and numerous other things about the Republic. And he was very good on Roman history and so on. So you would discuss this after you oh, would yeah, read to no, him? I, I exact, exacted my price, too. And he liked, I said something to the, I've just been writing about it. I've done a second volume of memoirs. And I asked him about being blind. I, I would lo love to quiz him. I said, when you dream, do you see things again? Well, he said, now that's an interesting question. And he's thought about it for a couple of days. And he said, I see things that I saw before I was blind. 
I said, you know, colors, can you, do so? can you imagine colors? Uh, yeah, I see blue sky, I see green grass, uh, but I don't know what my wife looks like. I don't know what my children look like, what the other senators look like. So what is it? He said, well, they're, they're voices in a hall. That's about it. So I plumbed him. As, I don't know, he's very good about radar. That was invented by the Brits during the Second World War. He said, every blind man knows about radar. As you walk toward a wall, he always would put his hands out in front of him. As you walk toward the wall, you can feel the sound waves bouncing off the wall onto your hand. And you can figure out distances. So we had some fantastic conversations, which I've been recalling in the memoir. You're writing that now? I've finished it. It's out, out in November. Out this coming November. This coming November, yeah. What's in it that we don't know now? Well, we Anything? Have to, have to read it. <laughs> it's a lot of things. It's, it's the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. Palimpsest was my first 40 years. Right. This is my second 40 years, and I promise there will not be a third. I've looked at the actuarial table. <laughs> 1948, The City and the Pillar. Mm -hmm. Did you ever dream that it would change, uh, or uh, um, it, it, that it would change the way that people looked at your writing? Oh, yeah. You knew that it was going to have that impact. Uh, I was a political child. You know, I, I knew about public opinion, which most writers don't know about <coughs> when they start, certainly. No, I knew it would be lethal in many ways, and it was. New York Times would review in the daily paper, uh, set in my next seven, eight books. Luckily, the Brits did, and luckily then I made my comeback with Julian, and they had to review. Simply because it was about homosexuality? Yep. Oh, they were vicious, these homophobes. Look at the attacks they used to do on uh, Tennessee Williams. That was more Time magazine. But they were in charge of trashing Tennessee. No, it was a venomous time, and it, it's always there. You know, Nothing to fret about. Does today's gay community understand that period? I don't know much about it. You know. I read things occasionally. I, I meet people. A professor in Melbourne, Australia, has written a book about me his name I can't remember, but his name is Dennis Altman. He wrote a good book on Foucault, and he's written one on me, and what changes he feels that I have made in the uh, Amer American imperial system. But uh, I don't see any great change in attitudes. If anything, there's a kind of desensitizing on every issue. Forget that. Just. Uh, there isn't much feeling, there's not much empathy for anybody, for anything. Look at how they got away with Katrina. You know, that was, that was even in Italy, the people were sorry for the African Americans who were abandoned to the waters. Is there a period in your life where you think that your writing did change people's ideas or thoughts or opinions about something? Well, that's why you write. <clears throat> I have no proofs that they do. Uh, that's why I turned essayist, and uh, luckily, just as I was turning myself into an essayist, the New York Review of Books got started, so I've been writing for them since the first issue. Yeah, you do change. I mean, I took two writers that Americans had never heard of, and to the extent that they had, they were not popular here, they weren't read. One was Dawn Powell, wonderful woman from the Middle West. And the other was Italo Calvino. I did long pieces on both of them. And they're all in print, and they're bestsellers now, and they're making movies out of them. Poor things, but anyway. Uh, yes, I feel I made a great, great influence at that time. Changing laws, you, don't, you have no idea what you contribute or, or subtract. What do you have left to do? What do I have left to do? Well, I am now an ancestral voice prophesying war. And I think that we are on the edge of the abyss. I think these fools are going to go ahead and attack Iran. 
with that, the Third World War begins, and this country is going to be destroyed. We're too small to carry on like this. We mean? still think we're so big and powerful. Well, we're not. We're broke. There is no money. There's going to be trouble servicing the debt, paying the interest on all those treasuries that we have loaned to other countries or let other countries invest in. Uh, we aren't going to be able to pay the interest, and we will be the first people to lie and cheat. We're so used to the mendacity coming from our government. They'll say, oh, we're doing it to restore democracy in the world, so we're not going to pay off what we owe. So we owe two or three trillion dollars. We, we're not going to pay it. We declare a moratorium for the United States of America because we're superior to every other country in the world. People should be glad to be living in the same world with us. That's enough for them, isn't it? And look at our wonderful television, and our wonderful movies, and uh, our food. You seem unhappy about it all. No one rejoices to see his country die. And I've watched, listened to the death rattle for some time now. Just as you think they can't push it any further, they push it a bit further. It's greed. It's got money for themselves, their friends, jobs, a sense of being somebody. Simultaneously goes along with uh, an ignorance that is just startling. You can't blame most American presidents for not knowing much about economics, but they should know something about history and politics. I mean, these people know nothing about anything. And everybody knows they don't. The main word, I, I, I've been studying the cephologists, and the main word that's coming along is incompetence. From all over, every, every level of our society is pointing the finger. These people just cannot do anything right. I did a piece on Bush, which I call him President Jonah, that he's jinxed everything he does. He can't even get prescription medicine out to old folks without doing something awful to, to jinx it. What do you think of the debate on immigration? As you have lived over this past 80 years and seen the whole immigration happen in this country. Well, the old cliche is true. We're all children of immigrants. And uh, I see no reason why. I quite agree with this, those blue-collar workers who said, what do you mean jobs that we don't want to do? We don't want to do it for nothing. But as we have no labor unions and as we have no uh, minimal wage, you, they're asking us to work for nothing. No health care, god-awful educational system for the general public. So I think uh, he's brought on a little revolution. Because I always said when the bright blue-collar workers wake up to the situation in the country, then you have a revolutionary uh, atmosphere in which things will be changed. Because they're not going to stick at it. And it may be, I feel sorry for the poor immigrants trying to come in, but the, uh, the awakening of the American working class is something to be you know, prayed for. Thank you for your time, George Adele. Thank you. Appreciate it.